May 29, 1943. A few weeks ago this year, April 1943, French aviator, poet, and novelist Antoine de Saint-Exupéry published his book Le Petit Prince, The Little Prince, while living in exile in New York. In the book, Saint-Exupéry and the Little Prince, a traveler from a distant asteroid, spend time in the desert trying to make sense of the strange, incomprehensible world of grown-ups. Saint-Exupéry explains, Grown-ups love numbers. When you tell them about a new friend, they never ask you about the important things. They never say, what does his voice sound like? What are his favorite games? Does he collect butterflies? They ask you, how old is he? How many brothers and sisters does he have? What does he weigh? How much does his father earn? The world of 1943 is a world of grown-ups, a world of numbers. Numbers that hide the broken hearts, the destroyed lives, the lost friends, the fall and the beauty of life. Hidden behind numbers that are so huge that they themselves have become incomprehensible. Like the weight of bombs dropped on Dortmund this week, or the number of passengers on trains arriving in Auschwitz or the trillions of grains of rice missing in Bengal. Now, a word from our sponsors. Never forget. Never give up. Never surrender. Join the Time Ghost Army. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olsen. Last week, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was ended after almost a month of intense resistance. 7,000 Jews died during the uprising, and 7,000 more were sent to Treblinka to be gassed. Berlin was declared free of Jews. The Axis powers continued their anti-partisan operation in Yugoslavia, and the British busted two German dams using a new, innovative type of bomb. This week... After a nine-day break to carry out that dambuster raid, the RAF sets yet another record in bombardment. On May 23rd, they launch a night raid on Dortmund using 826 aircraft. This raid will surpass the last record from the 4th of May on Duisburg. From the British perspective, the attack is a huge success. They managed to drop 2,000 tons of high explosives and incendiary bombs on the center and northern and eastern parts of the city. 2,000 buildings are leveled and the Hirsch steelwork plant is put out of action. Many thousand are rendered homeless, 1,275 people are injured, and over 600 people, mostly civilians, die. Two nights later, on May 25th, 759 aircraft attacked Dusseldorf. But this raid is a failure. Only 50 to 100 buildings are destroyed and 30 people killed. On May 27th, 518 RAF aircraft attack Essen, destroying 488 buildings, injuring 547 and killing at least 196. The deadliest raid this week comes on May 29th, when 719 RAF aircraft bomb Wuppertal. On this Saturday night, many air raid and firefighting officials are out celebrating the weekend in the countryside. So when the bombs start to rain down on the long, dense, historic city, many civilians are unprepared and firefighters are slow to react. A firestorm develops in the eastern part of the city, destroying 80% of the municipality of Bamen. Five of six major factories, 211 industrial buildings, and 4,000 residential houses are burned to the ground. An estimated 3,400 men, women, children, and infants die by being torn apart by shrapnel, crushed under debris, asphyxiated or burnt to death. The civilian death toll for the week is there by nearly 5,000, with countless more injured or homeless. The idea is that the destruction renders the victims unable to further support the German war machine, and that it might persuade others that the war that Hitler is waging in Europe is not in their best interest. The data from the blitz accumulated by the British themselves and the recorded reactions in Germany now in 1943 show another picture. Although the survivors in the immediate line of fire are demoralized, rendered apathetic and defeatist, at least temporarily, overall, the bombs harden national resolve. The goal to halt or at least decimate production is also not achieved. 
In June, the German war industry will produce roughly the same amounts of arms as in May. In July, slightly more. Compared to June and July the previous year, 1942, when the Thousand Bomber raids also failed to stop production, in June and July 1943, Germany will produce nearly twice as many infantry weapons, three times as many tanks, a third more other vehicles, three quarters more aircraft, a fifth more naval vessels, a third more ammunition, 50% more gunpowder, and a third more explosives. The Dramatic growth in output over the last year has been halted, though. But if that is mostly due to bombing, lack of materials, or production logistics, or a combination of factors, is unclear. You might argue that it's a significant achievement, but it is not the goal that Arthur Harris, head of RAF Bomber Command and Carl Spots, commander of the USAF in Europe, have set themselves. Moreover, it isn't this that is creating a deficiency of material and equipment on the front. The problem there is not availability, but accessibility, logistics. The stores are mostly stocked, but it's not always reaching the fighting men. The reaction of the Nazi higher echelons is also fairly sanguine, unalarmed and realistic, to not mention cynical. On June 5th, Reichspropaganda Minister Josef Goebbels writes in his diary, if we're talking about human lives, this has been the most severe air raid we have seen so far. This attack claimed this many lives because the inhabitants of Wuppertal have taken the threat too lightly. They thought that their city, located in a valley, couldn't be attacked. But I see that every German city is a potential target. The Americans and English have such formidable pilots that it's foolish to think that they wouldn't find Berlin, Cologne, or Leipzig. Formidable as they may be, they are not immortal, and their planes are not impervious to flak and fighter enemy aircraft. The campaign over the Ruhr is coming at a high cost for the Western Allies. In April, the RAF lost 256 aircraft, with more than half of the lost plane's crews killed. In May, they will lose 234, bringing the total since beginning of the increased bombing schedules in February to 1,068 aircraft lost. The U.S. Army Air Force carrying out daytime raids lost 149 of their heavy bombers for a total of 1,217 aircraft taken out with several thousand airmen killed in one single campaign in four months. The Luftwaffe loses about the same number, but on all fronts of their war. Being a U.S. or British Commonwealth airman bombing Germany has now become the deadliest assignment of the entire war. Both sides can sustain these material losses, at least for now. The United Nations allies are more than compensating losses by production, while the Axis are at least able to replace and still add some material force every month. Nonetheless, the war on German industry, infrastructure, and civilians is not developing into that crushing blow that Arthur Harris has touted for so long. It looks like it will be a long, slow, and very deadly war of attrition. All moral and legal issues aside, it is already questionable if there even can be a positive net effect on the war effort for any side. A risk that doesn't go unnoticed by the strategic planners in Washington and London. Some of the preparations for the Trident Conference between British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and US President Franklin Roosevelt this month included propositions for increase of joint command and oversight over the campaign, specifically to rein in Harris and his disregard for losses. However, before the conference takes place, Harris is hard at work lobbying to protect his command integrity, and the final decisions of the conference instead cement his autonomy over tactical deployment for RAF Bomber Command. On the Axis side, tactical deployment is also leading to unwelcome losses in their anti-partisan operations in Montenegro. The German, Italian, and Croat NDH forces expected that their encirclement of Tito's partisans in Montenegro to force the partisans into retreat and deliver fast victory. Instead, on May 21st, Tito launched an offensive on the Axis lines around Foccia. This week, that assault continues. For four days, partisan forces tried to pound the Axis left flank, guarded by the 118th Jäger Division and the Croatian 4th Mountain Brigade. 
and the SS Battalion Han on the right flank west of the Pita River. At one point, the Han Battalion is even briefly surrounded themselves. German commander Rudolf Lütters withdraws three battalions from the Sutjeska Valley to reinforce the 118th Jäger Division. But as they march toward Focha, elements of two partisan battalions attack that very valley. They quickly construct a bridge over the Sutjeska River to cut off the enemy advance. As the week ends, Lütters rushes to redeploy the 7th SS Division Prince Eugen to the north. But until they arrive, the German defenders are in dire straits on the defensive against a theoretically inferior force. Meanwhile, in France, the Germans pursue targets that cannot put up a fight. Since the first days of the occupation of France, the Nazis have been scouring the country to plunder valuable artworks. Many were brought to the Jeux de Pau Museum in Paris. There, Nazi leaders like Joachim von Ribbentrop or Hermann Göring, who visited the museum 20 separate times, have come to get their pick of the loot. Some works were, however, considered too degenerate or entartet and have been kept hidden in storage. That is, until this week on May 27, 1943. On this day, Countless works of avant-garde artists such as André Masson, Joan Miro, Francis Picabia, Max Ernst, Fernand Léger, and Pablo Picasso are taken into the courtyard of the Jeux de Pomme Museum and burned. But while that bonfire of reactionary chauvinism is lit, some French are refining plans to burn down the German, Nazi, and French collaborative regime. The same day as the Nazis remove the paintings, the Conseil National de la Résistance, CNR, meets for the first time. The growing anti-Nazi sentiment following widespread forced labor conscriptions has bolstered their numbers dramatically, but finally also brought a semblance of unity within the politically opposed factions of the French resistance. Edified by the Axis defeat at Stalingrad and North Africa, the armed resistance of the Maquis, mostly located in inhospitable areas such as the Alps and the Pyrenees, are now champing at the bit to be part of the liberation of France, and their numbers continue to swell. But action and more fighters requires better organization, more money, food, equipment, and arms. Despite the infighting both inside the Résistance and within the Free French forces abroad and without promised support from the British government, it looks like General Charles de Gaulle, leader of the Free French forces, representative in France, Jean Moulin, codenamed Rex, has managed to unify the resistance. On May 27th, in an apartment on the Rue de Four in Paris, he chairs a meeting of representatives from eight French resistance movements, six members of political parties, and two representatives of pre-war trade unions. Going forward, the CNR shall provide a decision-making structure formally headed by de Gaulle. The representative of the Popular Democrats Party, Georges Bidot, proposes a motion that the future provisional government shall be entrusted to General de Gaulle, who was the soul of the resistance during the dark days and who, since June 18, 1940, has never stopped preparing, in complete lucidity and in full independence, for the rebirth of the destroyed homeland and of the Republican liberties that were trampled. Highbrow words that to many might ring a bit out of tune with reality to not mention that it goes far beyond unifying the resistance. It settles the ongoing dispute between Henri Giraud, who has led the Free French participation in the reconquest of North Africa, and de Gaulle in London, who is the overall leader of the Free French forces on the side of the United Nations Alliance. Pierre Villon, representing the Front National, the, the Communists, tries to insert a clause demanding reconciliation between Giroud and de Gaulle. But after vehement opposition from the other delegates, Villon falls in line and the motion passes unanimously. While the Free French might now finally find unity under one domination, colonial domination-induced hunger claims its first lives in Bengal, British India. On May 23rd, one Mindapur journal reports five deaths from starvation this month, as well as eight cases of looting. Furthermore, it reports that, driven by the pangs of hunger, about 600 to 700 people are daily traveling by rail, mostly without tickets to Urissa, in the hope of procuring rice at a cheaper price. Similar scenes play out 
throughout Bengal as thousands of people in the countryside trying to sell whatever they have left to make way to Calcutta and other cities to find affordable food. But for many, that is a deception. On May 25th, a group of roughly 1,000 men, women, and children arrive at the town of Tamluk. But instead of sustenance, they are met by armed police and forced out of the town without a single grain of rice in hand. In the press, rumors start to circulate that the lack of British aid is because of an imminent abandonment of Bengal to Japanese invasion. One journal states that the situation on the front is very insecure for the British, who probably have realized that they will very quickly have to beat a retreat from Bengal with their tails curled under their bellies. It is for this reason that they are planning, we think, to decamp from this province with whatever booty they can loot be bits of straw or hay. Okay, that's not quite the case, but it is true that the Burma Offensive last winter didn't go too well for the Allies. The Japanese resistance was fierce and large numbers of Indian troops deserted to join the rebel Indian National Army. Meanwhile, the Indian public is left in the dark about what exactly is going on and why there isn't any food relief. While the vast majority of the 60 million people in Bengal are not considered to be worthy of aid, the mass murders in Eastern Europe of whoever the Nazis consider to be unworthy of life continue. With the order to spare as many as possible for murder by labor, the daily murder rates in the gas chambers have dropped from their high of 15,500 last autumn to 600 killed every day. Since... Teenagers and adults capable of work are being spared. The murder victims are mostly the sick, the infirm, pregnant women, young children, and babies. As the German SS continues to deport Jews and other undesirables from Western and Southern Europe in trainload after trainload, it is now Auschwitz-Birkenau that has become the central point of terror. Many are murdered immediately on arrival, but the camp complex is also swelling with slave workers. The various camps together now hold 140,000 prisoners, five crematoria with a dozen gas chambers. Between two and 3,000 German and foreign guards keep the masses in check and torture them. The crowded conditions are in and of themselves torture. Sanitary conditions are sparse at best. Food rations are poor and insufficient. The forced labor is grueling and medical care practically non-existent. Death by exhaustion or disease is a constant recurring event. Every hour, every day, they die. But on May 24th, there is a sign that there will be at least some relief. Under the new directors of Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler, the SS need to keep their victims at least healthy enough to work for as long as possible. A new doctor arrives on this day, and his first task is to curb an ongoing outbreak of typhus, especially rampant in the Sigoina Laga, the family camp for the Sinti in Roma. The next day, a transport of 1,035 Sinti in Roma from Bialystok in Austria arrives, but when the camp authorities expect some of them to carry typhus, instead of verifying this or trying to do something about it, the doctor orders that all men, women, children and infants of the transport be taken straight to the gas chambers and murdered. It looks like instead of upholding his oath to do no harm, this doctor is the instigator of suffering and bringer of death. He is Dr. Josef Mengele. Never forget. <laughs>